Okay, so as I mentioned last class, you're going to have a problem set every week. So there are 15 weeks in the semester, so we will have up to 15 problem sets. There might be on occasion we skip one, but... So you will have many, and all of the coursework is worth, what is it, 40% of the whole grade? So don't, like, one assignment out of 15, which is 40% of the total grade, is less than 4% of your total grade. So if you get half of them right, that's two out of four marks of your total grade. Right? Essentially. So obviously you want to try and do well on all your assignments, um, but don't stress if you didn't do well on one of them. It's not going to uh, break your achievement in this class. And also, um, really the purpose of doing these problem sets every week is to at least two purposes. One, um, in order to learn math, you have to practice. You have to do a lot. So some of you said, oh, it was a lot of problems. I'm like, this is just the beginning of a lot of problems. I told you you're going to do hundreds of problems this semester. That's the only way you get good at math. You don't get good at math by memorizing a definition. That does not help you be good at math. Being good at math requires practice. So that's one reason to do it. And even though I assign just this problem set, you should be doing more problems on your own, more than even what I assign. Right? What I assign is... Then the second purpose is to get feedback. So you can see, aha, on this set of problems, I did well. It seems I understood. Or if you see, oh, I got quite a few things wrong, that means I need to go back and study this one again. Do some more practice or ask questions. You can come and see me outside of class. This is not the only space in which we get to interact. So if in the problem set or in class something was really not clear and you need extra help, one, you can ask your fellow classmates. I expect that you are helping each other. There's no competition here, right? But also you can ask, can I come see you during the week? Or just send me a question. I didn't understand this. Could you cover it again next class or, or whatever? Right? I'm here for you to learn. Um, so those are the two reasons. So what are the two reasons for writing problem sets every week? Reason one, practice. What's reason one? Practice. practice. What's reason two? Feedback. feedback. Reason two is? Feedback. feedback. Reason one? Yes. Reason two? Okay, good. So, um, Michael is very carefully tearing pages out. Thank you. Um, right. So that first, what we started last week was very, we went over the syllabus, the course outline. We talked a bit about... <coughs> Actually, what did we talk about? Let's see what you remember. Mm. Hmm? Linear equations. Uh -huh. A little bit of review of linear equations. Yes. Um, so, what I'd like to start with today, um, actually before we start in the material itself, um, I want to do two things. So just to give us an idea, the plan today is to look at um, chapter one from the other textbook, um, Calculus Volume 1, which is a review of functions. So we need to understand what are functions because we're going to be, all of calculus is working with functions. So we want to remind ourselves what is a function um, and different kinds of functions and how to graph functions and so on. 
So that's most of what we're going to do today. Um, but before that, I want to... So today we're going to look at functions. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about the assignment that you just did. And um, a little, what shall we call it? Um, sort of the motivation for calculus. So those are the, the topics for today. One, two, three. So let me start with, so from the assignment, was there, did you find it, it was many problems, you said, fine. Um, were they relatively easy or did you find some of them more challenging? Which ones, and maybe we can talk a bit about those. Um, if it's helpful, I could put up the questions again on the board here. Um, so let me see if it's... Ha! Can you see? So this was exercise 1.1. So there were some calculations with negative numbers, um, simplifying algebraic expressions, yep. um, and then solving for the values of an expression. So substituting for the variables. So far, was any of this challenging? No, this was all okay for those who did it. Linda, that was okay? Yeah, you did those two. Were they okay? Okay. Um, so then we had uh -huh, order of operations, number eight. Part A. So Quickly, what is the value of this? Minus 4 in brackets squared. Can you read okay from there? Let me see. Yeah, that's big enough. So what's minus 4 all squared? 16. Yeah? Now, if on your calculator you were to press these keys, minus and then 4, and then the squared operation, you would get the answer. What is the answer you think you would get for this? What did I do with the pen? All right. So we are saying minus 4 squared is 16. If I type minus 4 and then the square button, which is called x squared usually, what would this be equal to? Negative 16. Why? Because your calculator obeys order of operations. It says you square a number before you take negatives. So what it's doing is this, and that's negative 16. All right. How about these ones? Adding, subtracting, dividing. Mm -hmm. Factorizing expressions, simplifying, any of this, was this all okay? Mike? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then these last two, what we call word problems. How was this? No. no. Okay. I'm not surprised. Most students find, was it the math that was hard or was it understanding what it's asking that was hard? 
understanding what it's asking, right? That's, that's usually the case. So this is going to be very important. So I'm going to show you how I was taught to solve these kinds of problems. First, let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, not that big. <coughs> um, which one is actually easier? Well, we'll start with number 17. Um, when you get a word problem, the first thing you do is you read the whole problem, yeah? The whole question. And <clears throat> you're looking for two things. You want to understand, usually a word problem is the, a presentation of a situation. So you're trying to understand what is the situation. Um, and you're also looking for what am I being asked to do, or what am I being asked for? What do I have to find? And then the second thing, what information am I being given? No? But first step, we just read it. So a law firm seeks to recruit top quality experienced lawyers. Okay. so. We're talking about a firm wants to recruit people. The fact that they're lawyers is not, well, we don't know if it's important. The total package offered is the sum of three separate components. A basic salary, which is 1.2 times the candidate's current salary, together with an additional $3,000 for each year worked as a qualified lawyer, and an extra thousand dollars for every year that they are over the age of 21. Work out a formula that could be used to calculate the total salary S offered to someone who is A years of age, has E years of relevant experience, and who currently earns N dollars. Hence, work out the salary offered to someone who is 30 years old with five years experience and who currently earns $150,000. What do you understand so far? What is this situation? So let me be more specific. What are we being asked to find? What is this asking us to do? <coughs> So there's a few, do you want to read it again? Take a minute and see if you can find it. Do you need to sit closer, Mike? Or are you squinting or? <coughs> Sorry. So, oh. if you read the first paragraph, is it asking us for anything? Is it information or is it asking us for something? It's information. So we might need it, but it's not asking us to do anything. So let's go to the second paragraph. Is that asking us for anything? What is it asking us to do? It's asking us for a formula. Work out a formula, right? That means find the formula, write it down. So step, the first thing we're asked for is uh, a formula for the total salary S. Okay, is it asking us to do anything else? 
what? It is asking us something else. What is the something else? So someone who is Aha, okay. So then part two is find the salary S um, when, and now I'm going to use some of the variables just to make it shorter. So this person is 30 years old. So A equals 30. Experience is E. E equals how much? Five. And N is 150,000. This is what we're asked for. When you're given a word problem, the first thing you need to identify is what am I being asked to do? If I'm not sure what I'm being asked to do, then I can't do anything really, right? It's just information. So I'm asked for this. Now the second step is, okay, so I need the formula for the salary S. Now I ask, I go back and I, and I have to read carefully the whole thing because there can be information in different places. What is the information I am given? So we'll start from the top again. The first sentence is just uh, a context. So very often word problems begin with some context. A law firm wants to recruit experienced lawyers. Fine, there's nothing mathematical in that, but it just gives me an idea of what is this about. Um, the next sentence, now we're getting into something useful. The total package offered is the sum of three separate components. Okay, so S is something plus something plus something. All right? That's what that means. Now, what are the three things? A basic salary, which is 1.2 times the candidate's current salary. Okay, so this is 1.2 times current salary. And notice at this stage, I'm not trying to use the letters and all. I can just write in a way that makes sense to me. I'm trying to understand the problem, right? Um, next, together with, okay, so now the second term in my sum is an additional 3,000 for each year worked as a qualified lawyer. So 3,000 times the number of years of years as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Does this reflect what's in the paragraph? Okay. And the last, what's the third part, the third component? an extra okay how would we write this we could write a thousand dollars times years over 21. this is not yet a very mathematical but for me to understand <laughs> Now, um, am I ready to do A? Actually, so A, or sorry, not A, number one, asked to work out a formula that could be used to calculate the total salary S offered to someone who is, so now it's giving us, it's not enough, not, not just write a formula for the salary. And then I could say, okay, here's your formula. But that's not enough. What is it asking? I have to use these variables, A, E, and N, as the way that I write my formula. So we're going to do that. Yeah? OK, so A, what is A? A is age, right? In years. Um, and units are important. Uh, no, I was going to write B, A, B, C. A, E, what is E? E? Years 
of relevant experience, right? So it's not enough that you have work experience, it's relevant experience, experience as a lawyer. And then N, what is N? N is in units of dollars, but what does N represent? Amount of money? Amount of money of what? Where, what is that amount of money? What does it? The current salary. So current salary in dollars. Here I wrote years, so it's already in years. Right? So that's A, E, and N. Now here I need current salary, which is N. So I can, now I'm going to rewrite S. So S is 1.2 times N. 1.2 N. And you know we don't need to write the multiplication when you have a number and a symbol, a letter, right? Plus, how do we write this one now? So number of years as a lawyer, here we said years of relevant experience, which is the same thing. So we could write 3,000 E, 3,000 times E. And what about the last one? How do we write that? So this is this plus this plus what? <coughs> it's going to be a thousand times something, right? A plus 21? N? So what is N? N is current size. And what do we need? A, H. Age. So something related to age. So age is my actual age, right? Like I could be 18 or 10 or 35 or 96 or whatever. But this is asking, this is not asking for the age. What is this asking for? How many years? Over 21. So if my age is 22, what would this number be? If my age is 22, how many years over 21? One year, right? If my age is 31, how many, what would be this? 10. So how are you getting those numbers? You're going age minus 21. That's what it means to be how many years over 21, right? So if I'm 22 minus 21, then I'm one year over 21. What if I'm 21 exactly? How many years over 21 am I? Zero. Zero. I'm not over 21. <laughs> I am 21, <laughs> right? So this works. This gives us what we need. Yeah? So we actually have this, and the bracket is important. It's not a thousand times a, it's a thousand times a minus 21. So if I'm 31, I should get 31 is a difference of 10 years times a thousand dollars, I should get ten thousand dollars. Right? So a minus 21 is 31 minus 21 is 10 times the 1,000. So the brackets are important. Are we finished? Have we, fi have we done number one? Yeah? OK. So then we would write the, the salary offered would be given by, let me To be complete, this is good practice. When you're given a word problem, the other part is 
you have to state the answer. You don't just write this somewhere on the page, but then you say the the salary offered is given by the formula blah. You would write this and this would be an answer to what you're asked for. All right? Then we have to do part two. Um, which is easy. So that was number one. Number two would be, so S, when A equals 30, E equals 5, and N equals 150,000, equals... So then we plug it in, right? 1.2 times 150,000 plus, and you can do the rest. So this would be how to approach a word problem. The first step is, first, read the whole thing. Two, find what you are asked for. And you have to really pay attention, because you can be asked for different things, and it could ask for something Right? There might be something up here that says find something, something, and then it gives you more information and then do something else. And then, so you have to read the whole thing carefully and identify what am I asked for, which is what we did up here. Then what is the information I am given? So I write down, I'm given these variables. I erased it now, but we were given some these components. We wrote those down. Then we see, okay, I'm asked for this. I'm given this information. How do I use this information to find what I'm asked for? And then I work it out. Any questions or comments? Did anyone teach you how to do word problems? No? Okay. You're going to get more practice. So I'll probably, well, I'll erase this now because we're done with it and I might need the board again. So that was one part of the assignment. Um, we won't do number 18, but it's kind of similar, right? Um, I suppose some of this might be a bit trickier because it's from a context that may not be familiar to us. So when it says a plumber has a fixed callout charge, so what's a callout charge? A callout charge is when if I call the plumber and say, I have a problem, can you come? The plumber says, sure. Just for coming, the moment he walks in my door, He's going to charge me $80. He hasn't done a minute of work, but just for coming, he charges this, right? Then he has an hourly rate of, so then he sees, okay, tell me what's the problem. He looks, he tries to fix. If it takes him one hour, two hours, whatever, then an hourly, he has that many hours times the $60. So there's a fixed amount, 80 plus $60 per hour. So if you're reading a word problem and you don't understand even what the number is, what is this call-out charge, then you have to, it's fair to ask, what is this, I don't know what this is, and I shouldn't guess. You should know, you should, right? Um, so then in this case, what is the total charge C for a job that takes L hours in which the cost of materials and parts is K. So this is interesting, right? What is it asking us to do? Work out the total charge, C. And it tells us you should call it C. Okay, fine. 
So we want C. So we can write C equals question mark. This was, this was how I was taught. You start with, what am I asked for? Question mark. And then, what am I given? <coughs> what do you want to call it? We have to give it a letter. Maybe. We don't have to, but we can. Huh? Yeah. What letter shall we use? Hmm. X. X, okay. X equals 80. And then... Yeah, we might not even need to write all of this, but it's fine. Hourly rate. What will be the letter for hourly rate? Love this. Y. Y. Y equals 60. Is that all the information we need? Or we're given? Are we given any other information? Mm -hmm. So K equals cost of materials. I'll just write mats, materials, and parts. And then what is, anything else? What about the L hours? Uh -huh. L is the hours worked. OK, this is all the information we are given. Sometimes you don't have to use all the information you are given. In this case, you will. But for you to remember, you have to think, I need this. I have all this information. How can I use what I'm given or some of what I'm given to arrive at what I need? Right? So here, what would we write? The total cost is what? So the total cost for a job. So the plumber gets called out for a job. And we want to know what will be the total cost. What is a formula for the total cost of that job? Exit. OK. <laughs> Plus so this was the fixed call-out charge. Fixed call-out charge. This was the hourly rate. <coughs> we may not have needed the letters in truth, but it's fine. So one thing is to also think, before you even write an equation, you, can, you think about it. You say, okay, the total charge, what, what costs go into a job? So we said one is the call-out charge. Anytime the plumber does a job, he charges $80 just for coming. So the job will have the $80. The cost for the job will have $80. What else do I have to pay the plumber? There's the $80. What else? There's an hourly rate. So if he spends one hour, then... Now, do we, we were told that we have hours worked, and we were given a letter L. If it didn't give you the letter, then you can pick any letter you want. But here we were given the letter, so we will use it. So we'll say, so I'm going to just go right away and write 80 plus 60L, right? And I have to remember that I'm writing an equation in dollars. Yeah, I'm not going to write dollar signs everywhere, but I have to remember that these are in units of dollars. The reason that's important, if I tell you there's something that is in cents, right? Cents. You've got dollars and cents. You know what are cents? Cents are the fraction, the hundredth of a dollar. So if I say it's uh, ninety-eight point six five dollars, yeah, this is ninety-eight dollars and sixty-five cents. So now, if somebody's in here, if we were told something, something in cents, 
then when I come to write it in this equation, I have to think, aha, this is in dollars. I can't write the number in cents and still get the dollars. I have to convert cents into dollars. The units matter. But here everything is in dollars, so it's easy. So anything else, I put a plus sign, but I don't know if we need a plus sign. Is that everything? Is that the total cost of a job? We have the call-out charge and we have the hours worked. Are we finished? Okay, Justin thinks yes. Who else thinks yes or thinks no? When you call the plumber, you will have to pay him the 80 plus the hours that he worked. Anything else? So, actually, uh, mm -hmm. for the owner. so the plumber says, I need to replace your pipe and the pipe, the new pipe costs something. Who do you think has to pay for that? I do. So I also have to pay K. So it depends what he has to do. If he doesn't need any materials or parts, then it'll be nothing. But if he has to use something, then that's part of my cost. So then this is the answer for A. Right? Okay. All right. So then the next one was... And the other ones are all versions of this. So one is a currency exchange booth. This should be interesting to you. Um, In-house training. So there's different kinds of workers. There are semi-skilled workers and skilled workers. And they need different number of hours of training. So this is an easy one, actually. And then a car hire company charges, how much do you have to pay, depending on how many days and how many miles you drive a car, or you rent the car, you hire. Um, this is the 1.1 star, this was not part of the assignment. And the next one was here, 1.2. This was now fractions. So I'm just going to scroll if there was anything that was like, wait, can we look at that? Because I didn't understand that part. Just say. Number three. Number four. Factorizing. Simplifying. That's the one. Uh-huh. Number five. Do you want to read it for us? Read the what we're asked for first. Mm -hmm. So which of these fractions can be simplified? Only one of them can be simplified. Mm. The first one? How can you simplify it? Okay, it's x minus y over. Uh, it's one of that, uh, do you want to do it on the board? Come. Now I will be the student. The answer is two. Everybody happy? Charles, Mike, happy? 
Charles, you're looking. Huh. What do you think? Is this clear or not agree? I think because of the whole thing that is <laughs> you think one over two. Why do you think one over two? Because um, <laughs> this was good, Justin. Let me take the marker. So Justin has the right idea. Is it true that you can fact? So we have x minus one over 2x minus 2. And he notices that you can factorize 2 out of the denominator. So you can write 2 times x minus 1. This is correct. So now we have x minus 1 divided by 2 times x minus 1. This is correct. And you can cancel the x minus 1 and the x minus 1. Also correct. The last step is, now what is the result of canceling them? is a half. Because, why is it a half? x minus 1 over 2 times x minus 1. When you cancel something, what you're doing is you're, you're dividing two things that are equal, right? So if this is like 3 divided by 3 is what? 1. So you're left with 1. The other way to think of it is there's always, you can always think of one times whatever is there. But you don't have to write one times, it doesn't change anything, so we don't write it. But when you cancel this and this, then that, that one that you know is there, or can be there, now it's important, now it matters. Because this was dividing by two. Something divided by two times something it's still, there's a divided by 2, right? Okay. This is, I have noticed many students get, um, get this wrong. They do the same thing. So you want to remember, if something is being divided, then it still has to be in the denominator in the answer. Right? Okay. And then, why can this not be simplified? That's the other part of the question, right? Which one can be simplified? This one. So that means this one and this one, according to the question, explain why the other two cannot be simplified. So you can assume they can't. But why can't they be simplified? They are different. They are different, but these are also different. Oh, different in what? Uh -huh. The is supposed to is Suppose I suppose I wrote this. Now there's a negative and a positive. Can this be simplified? What would this be, if you think it can be simplified? Just negative 1 is enough. Does everybody follow this? Why this is negative 1? Linda? You follow? <coughs> Do you follow? Yeah. Yeah? X plus 2 divided by x plus 2. That's 1 over 1, which is just negative 1. So the reason these cannot be simplified is that this and this have no common factors. Here, there is a common factor. The common factor is x minus 1. I can factorize into 2 and x minus 1. And then when I factorize, now these two can cancel and I can simplify. But this cannot be factorized more. 
This cannot be factorized more, neither of them. So these are already simplified. There's nothing wrong with them, but these are already simplified. This was not yet simplified. These are already simplified. They are as simple as you can make it. You cannot make it more simple than this. Okay, then we had some more division of fractions, multiplying, adding, subtracting, and dividing fractions. Um, mm -hmm. And then some inequalities. You're okay working with inequalities? Huh? 11. Okay. Which one do you want to do? A, B, C, or D? B? So simplify 7x plus 3 is less than or equal to 9 plus 5x. Is that correct? Yeah? Okay. So we are asked to simplify. In this case, uh, we could simplify by putting the x's together and the constants together. So we have two terms with x's and two terms that are constants, right? We have 7x and 5x, so we could put those together. And we have 3 and 9, <coughs> and we could put those together. So these are both positive terms. So I usually take the one that has the bigger coefficient, and then I subtract this one from both sides. So what we're going to do is the same as with equalities. You, have the, you can do the same things, multiply, divide, add, and subtract from both sides. And that preserves this relationship, with the exception of multiplying by negative 1, which we'll see. So here I could do minus... 5x and minus 5x on both sides. And then I still preserve the same inequality, right? Is that okay or should I explain why? Right. If I have 2 is less than 3, is this true? 2 is less than 3? Yes. Okay. If I subtract 2, then I will have 0 is less than 1. Is this still true? If I add uh, plus 8 plus 8, this will be 10 is less than 11. Is that true? Is it, do you think now, if I add or subtract any number from both sides, will the answer still be true? If I, so now, if I add or subtract any number, A, and then I add or subtract the same number from the other side, then I will have 2 plus or minus A is less than 3 plus or minus A. This will still be true. No? See, if I take 2 plus 1,000 and 3 plus 1,000, I will have 1,002 less than 1,003, which is true. So when you have an, an inequality, you can add and subtract from both sides, and it still keeps the inequality true. The same if I multiply or divide. If I multiply by 2, Right? What is this? 2 times 2, 4, less than 3 times 2, 6. What about the opposite? If I divide by 2, what do I have? 
1. 3 divided by 2. 3 divided by 2. One and a half. You could write like this, you could write three halves, you could write 1.5, these are all the same thing, right? And is this true? One is less than one and a half? Yes. So do you think it matters what number I put? Here we use two. Could we use any other number? Could we use one, three, seven, 98? It would be true, right? So I can also multiply or divide both sides, and it's still true. The same as with an equality, right? When I say 2x equals 5, and then you say, okay, let me divide, and you know, I could divide by 2, then x is 5 halves, right? You can do the same thing when there's an inequality, with one, except with one twist. And the twist is, if I, I'm going to move my symbols over a little bit. If I multiply by minus 2, or if I divide by minus 2, then what do I get? Let's start with this one. 2 times minus 2. <coughs> minus 4. And here, 3 times minus 2? Minus 6. Minus six. Which one is bigger? Minus 4 is bigger. So now the sign goes the other way. Okay? What about this one? 2 divided by minus 2? 12? Minus 1? 3 divided by minus 2? Mike? Negative? Negative 1.5? Now, which one is bigger? Linda. Linda. Which one is bigger? Minus one. So, which way does the inequality, which way should we draw the inequality? Dustin, I'm asking Linda. Huh? I should draw it like this or like this? To the left or to the right? Like this. Okay. So notice, when you multiply or divide by a negative number, it inverts the sign of the inequality. Instead of being less than, it becomes greater than, or vice versa, right? If I had written 3 greater than 2 multiplied by minus 2, then I would have minus 6 less than minus 4. So I would flip the inequality. Only when you multiply or divide by a negative number. And it doesn't even matter. Maybe this was negative 2 at the start, right? This is still true. 3 is greater than negative 2. True? Is 3 greater than negative 2? Yes. So what is, so 3 times negative 2, we said is negative 6, that's fine. Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. Now which one is bigger? Negative 6 or 4? Four? 4. So the sign flips. So it doesn't matter whether these numbers are positive or negative. It only matters whether you're multiplying by a negative number or a positive number or dividing, multiplying or dividing. Clear? Okay. Now you should practice this on your own. All right. So back to this one. Okay. So we saw you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, the same as with an equation. So we're going to do the same thing. All right. Do you think you can take it from here? You want to try would you want me to do this one? I'll do this one. So we're going to subtract this. Now maybe at the same time we do the other one. So let's say, okay, I have 3 and 9. I want the constants. I can see that I'm going to cancel the x here. 
So I'm going to have x's on this side. Now maybe I put the constants on that side. So I'm going to subtract 3 and subtract 3. So what am I going to get? 7 minus 5 is 2x. 3 minus 3 is 0. Since I'm only adding and subtracting, my inequality doesn't change. Right? Even if it's a negative number, the inequality doesn't change when adding or subtracting. It only changes when you multiply or divide by a negative number. 9 minus 3 is 6. 5 my x minus 5x is 0. So now, can I simplify this? What would it be? Okay. Which gives? X is, what do you, how do you read this? Not greater than. What, how do you read this? Less than or equal to 3. So this is how you would simplify that equation. Do you want to try doing another one? Ask. This is the time to ask. This is why we're here. Minus, okay. Then what would we do? Let's start over. What would we do? What do you think we would do? What would you do? So the same strategy, we want the x's on one side and the constants on one side. So the first thing is you have to pick a side. And the, the truth is there's not a right side and a wrong side. You just have to pick a side. And if at the end you think, oh, I would like it to flip, then you just minus and minus and you move them around. Right? So there's no wrong answer. You just have to pick a side. Do you want to put the x's here or the x's here? You want them on this side? So how are you going to get rid of this one? If you have minus 5x, what do you do to get rid of the minus 5x? How do we, how do we get minus 5x to go to the other side? What do we add or subtract or multiply or divide? Say again. Add 5x. Okay. If we add 5x, <laughs> minus 5x plus 5x would be 0. Is that what we want? Yes. That means it goes away. But we're not done. We can't just do it on this side. If we add 5x here, we have to also add 5x here. We have to preserve the truth of this expression. Right? Okay. Anything else? What else? Now the constants. Where do we want the constants to go? On the right or on the left? On the right? Okay. So what are we going to do? How do we get the 3 to go away? Subtract 3. Okay. And now what do we get? Seven plus five is twelve x. Three minus three zero. How do we read this? Less than or equal to. Zero. Now can we simplify? You could do 6 or 12. What do we get? This will be x. And then? 
and this will be a half. And what symbol goes here? It's less than or equal to. Less than or equal to. Yes. Then we're supposed to divide both sides. If uh, one second, <coughs> if it was greater than. Okay. So you want to see what would happen if this was greater than like this? What would this mean? No. Would it be a different answer? So if we started with this where it was greater than or equal, so we started with this expression, and we ended up with x is less than or equal to a half, right? If we started with greater than or equal, then we would still have greater, we do the same thing here. Yeah, x can be anything, right? Then we still have greater than or equal. We divide by 12, we still have greater than or equal. So now we have x is greater than or equal to a half. So the operations we did are the same. We added 5x, we subtracted 3, and then later we divided by 12. All of that would be the same. And we would end up with the same number, a half. But these, are these two things the same? No. This is saying if you have a number line, and let's say this is 0, and this is 1, and this is negative 1. What is this telling us? What can x be? What number can x be? Well, x can be anything that is less than or equal to a half. So a half is here. So this is all of that forever. Yeah? Any number here is less than or equal to a half which means any number x less than or equal to a half will satisfy this inequality. If you put that number, if you pick any number here that is less than or equal to a half, and you put it in here, this will turn out to be true. Well, actually, the greater than means this one, right? But that's what we're doing. What we're solving for, just like when we solve an equality, when if this was the equal, yeah, then at the end we would say x is equal to a half. Which means if I put x equals a half and x equals a half, then this becomes true. Right? Any other number, it's not true. Yeah? But when you have an inequality, so let me go back to the less than, which was the first one. I'll get rid of this now. When we have the less than, then any value of x that satisfies this will also satisfy this. It will make this true. We can test it. Pick a number less than a half. Any number. Charles. One point four, which is seven fifths. Is that less than or a half? This, this is greater than 1, right? 1 is greater than a half. So this is greater than a half. We want a number less than a half. So how about 0 0.4? 0, 
If we wrote a half in decimals, what would it be as a decimal number? Not 1.5. Wait, I know you know. <laughs> Give other people the chance. A half written as a decimal number is 0 0.5. Maybe we need to review the number line. Yeah? And decimal numbers. If this is 0 and this is, well, OK, that's a whole other lesson. I won't do it now. Um, but a half is equal to 0 0.5. It's 5 tenths, which is a half. These are the tenths. These are the units, hundredths, thousandths, and so on. Units, when you write a number, like 235, this is 5 times 1 plus 3 times 10 plus 2 times 100. Ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on. That's the decimal system. And then when you put a dot, and you have 6, 2, 3, these are the tenths the hundredths, the thousandths, and so on. So whenever we write a number, it's the sum of, in a way, how many hundreds, how many tens, how many ones, how many tenths, how many hundredths, how many thousandths, and so on. And you can put zeros, right? You might say, well, there are no tens and there are no units, no ones. Maybe there are no hundreds. But the places matter, yeah? Just because there's a zero doesn't mean you ignore it. This is not the same as two, right? Two zero zero is 200, right? 200 is not the same as two, is it? So the zeros matter. They tell us what place is the two, right? If I write this, now, what is this number? Why? How do you know it's thousands? Because it has zeros, and the zeros have a meaning, right? They matter, those places. Okay, that's a very, very quick reminder about decimal place system. Um, so, let's try with point 0.4. 7 times point 0.4 plus 3. So what is 7 times 0.4? Seven times four. What is seven times four? Mm. Twenty-eight. Now there's a zero point four, so we there's a decimal one place to the left, so we write twenty-eight, and the decimal goes here, so it's two point eight. Cool, huh? Plus three, less than or equal to uh, nine times, oh, up here, 9 minus 5 times 0 0.4. Oh, I guess I'll keep the 9. So what's 5 times 0, 0 0.4? Try to do the same thing we did here. Huh? 2.0 minus 2.0, which is 2. OK, let's add these. What is this? Mm -hmm. 3 plus 2.8 is 5.8. What is this? 9 minus 2 is 7. Is this true? Is 5.8 less than or equal to 7? 5.8 is not less than or equal to 7? Yes or no? Yes. Why? And the symbol says 5 and 10 is this. It can be true if it's less than. But S are not equal. So, in fact, this number can be equal. These two numbers are not equal. Yes. That's obvious. Yeah, we all agree. So, what does this symbol mean? Less than or equal to? It means that this side must be less or equal. 
It's not going to be both, but it can be one or the other. It can't be greater than, it can be less than, or it can be equal to. This symbol by itself means strictly less than, which means this has to be less than that. It cannot be equal to that. When you add the line, then it's less than or equal. So now this can be equal to that, or this can be less than that, but not greater than that. So there's a difference between, when you add the line, there is also the possibility that they are equal. Here, they are not equal. But this is less than that, so this is true. Which means point four is a valid solution of this inequality. That's what it means that we got this. It means now I know I can pick any number x that is less than or equal to a half. And when I plug it in here, the answer will be true. Now, let's do it with, let's show when it's not true. Let's prove to ourselves that we can break the inequality, right? So let's pick a value of x that is not, that doesn't satisfy this, that is greater than a half. We'll pick a very simple x, let's pick one. Yeah, one is greater than a half, yeah. So, one is not part of this. Agreed? Okay, so let's put one. Now, this will be easy. Seven times one plus three is what? Ten. Nine minus five times one is what? Four. Which one is? Right? We're supposed to have, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. We're supposed to have this. But this is not true, right? So one is not a valid solution of this inequality. Make sense? Yeah? Mike? Does it help now? The way you would read it, so this is false. I mean, I can write anything using math symbols, but it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah, I mean, so, is that, is that 10, is 10 is less than or equal to 4 is not true. This is not true. Yeah. So, but I did this just to prove that these are the valid solutions. If I choose a number that is not from here, then it breaks the inequality. It does not satisfy the inequality. Okay. All right. So, and then the same vice versa. If we start with the equation, but we start with greater than or equal to, then our solutions are anything where x is greater than or equal to a half. Right? <coughs> So then if we chose 0 0.4, 0 0.4 would break this again, if this was the relationship. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, inequalities, and that was it. All right. So we spent a good amount of time reviewing the assignment, um, which is good. Um, so let's go on to, how much time do we have? About half an hour. Um, motivation. So we're not going to do much of functions today. We've We'll have to do more of that next week. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit, actually, where did the chair, was this my chair? I'm going to sit for a bit. I wanted to say a little bit about motivations for studying calculus. And I asked, so these are the things that these new AIs are good for. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, 
just bring it up. Uh, it's a bit big. Whoops, come back. I lost you. This is weird. Oh, it's, ha. Huh. Um, <coughs> so I asked ChatGPT, <coughs> how is calculus used in accounting practice? Are you all accounting majors? Anybody doing auditing? You're doing auditing. Okay. Auditing, accounting, sort of close, right? So I asked, how is calculus used in accounting practice? And the answer is, well, not the answer, but what ChatGPT says, which is, I looked at it and it seems generally true. Um, calculus isn't commonly used in day-to-day -day practice. So what we will be learning, most of what accountants do is um, bookkeeping and financial statements, right? Is anybody, what are you all planning to do with your, what would you like to do with your degree? You want to do banking. What else? Who, is, who else has a, an idea what they want to do with their degree? Justin, were you going for finance ministry? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Mike? Have you thought about what you're going to do? Uh huh. Chartered accountant. So full on accounting. Okay. What are you planning to do? And it's okay to say I don't know yet. I didn't know. Even after four years, I still didn't know. <clears throat> but do you have an idea? Auditing financial transactions. Okay. And love this? You don't know yet? Do you have some things that you're that you like, that you're attracted to from what you've learned so far? Not sure yet. Okay. So Everything you've mentioned mostly falls under general accounting practice. And calculus is not commonly used in that day-to-day -day practice. Mostly you need addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, a little bit of maybe exponents if you're doing um, future value calculations or depreciation. Ah, you will learn about, do you know about depreciation? Everybody knows what depreciation? Yeah? Inflation? You know what is inflation? Inflation. You've heard of inflation. Uh, it, mm, it's opposite. <coughs> huh? <coughs> Say again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In an economy, there is money. Uh, they're not opposite, like the way that addition and subtraction are opposites, that if you do one and you do the other, it's net zero. Dev devaluation and inflation are not opposites like that. You could have inflation and devaluation, and the effect is not zero. In fact, the effect is worse when you have both. 
So this is not a business. I mean, do you want to talk about what is inflation and devaluation? <laughs> we can, but it's not really in the, in the course. Um, we could talk about it outside of class. How about that? If you want to talk more, we can stay after. And, but the, the reason I mention them is those are sort of in the, in the world of, um, so you've probably learned already, well, maybe you've learned already, a compound interest. Have you learned about compound interest? Yeah? Compound interest. What is compound interest? As opposed to simple interest. That's the other kind. Simple or compound? So there are these two, two different kinds. Right? What is simple interest? You know what is interest on a loan. You have to pay interest on a loan, right? So what is simple interest on a loan? Let's say I borrow 100,000 kwacha, and you say the interest is 10% per year, or 20% per year, yeah? Then how much interest do I have to pay every year? A hundred thousand. Hmm. I have to pay twenty thousand every year. If I if I don't repay it, the hundred, then every year I have to pay you twenty. That's simple interest. Right? Whatever the twenty percent of the initial amount, that the same thing every year. So what is compound interest? The time period doesn't matter, monthly, annual. So compound is when I start with 100,000 here, and then every year I have to pay 20,000 as interest, right? The principle, you know this term, principle? Everybody knows this word? you know this word? No? The principle is when I borrow money, or if you're the bank and you lend, you give someone a mortgage for, I don't know, they want to, how much is it to build a house? Yeah. Miss Banker, do you have a number? 50 million something, more, less? 50 million, it's reasonable. Okay, so I come to you and I say, I want to borrow 50 million to build a house. And then you do your checks and you say, okay, we will lend you 50 million. You have lent me a principal, right? That's the amount I borrowed of 50 million. That's the principal. Now I have to pay back to you the principal, that 50 million, plus interest. So whatever you charge me extra above the 50 million is interest. But the 50 is called the principal. And you calculate the interest based on the principal, some percentage of the principal, usually. So here, every year, so in year one, it's 20% of 100. In year two, it's 20% of 100. In year three, it's 20% of 100 and so on. It will always be 20, per the principle never changes. That's simple interest. Okay. Now, compound interest. Principle and interest. And then year. One, two, three, so on. So in year one, I have borrowed 100,000, so my interest is the same 20%, yeah? We're talk my mark is running out, 20% interest, okay? So my interest will be how much? 20,000. Okay, 
Now, in year two, my principal becomes, it's not 100 anymore. What the bank does, this is how you make lots of money, is you say, uh, let's say I borrowed the 100. I'm not, I can't pay you the 20 yet. So you say, okay, I add it to your principal. Now I have lent you 100. I've lent you another 20, because you haven't paid it yet. So I'm, right? So now, you owe, I owe you 120. So what is the interest now? It's 20% of this number, which is 24,000. Okay? Now again, I say, I'll pay you back, don't worry. You say, fine. Now, I owe you 144, not 20 more, 24 more, okay? Now how much interest do I owe you here? Now it gets a bit mathematical, it'll be 20 something, 28,800, 28, right? You can check, I think that's right. And now again, I don't pay you, so you say, okay, I add it to your principal. So now it's uh, one, seven, two, eight, zero, zero. And it keeps going. And you will see here, if I added every year, so the same thing, you could add this to what I owe you, but I would just, you would just add 20,000 every year. It would go 100, 120, 140, 160. So already, 160 compared to 172,800. Compound interest builds up. Um, so there's some calculus involved. I haven't shown you the calculus part yet but there's some calculus you can use when you're dealing with things like compound interest or the present value of a future cash stream. So if you're gonna be a chartered accountant, you may have to, in the financial statements, your client might say, I expect, you know, we have this land or this whatever asset and it generates revenue, yeah? Maybe we have land and somebody is leasing it for 100 years. You know, the rail company is leasing my land. We have a 75-year lease. For 75 years, they're going to pay me this amount every year. How do you value that in the financial statements? Today, what is it worth that I have 75 years of this cash coming in? Calculus helps us with that a little bit, no? Um, so, but in general, um, where calculus deals with derivatives and integrals, you mostly won't use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the reason it's part of your training is it is used, and it's, well, I think two reasons. So, one, if you understand the concept of what it is, it helps you to also um, to think more in a more refined way about the situations that you will encounter in business or finance or anything, to understand economic news. Um, but also, it will come in, depending on where you specialize or what you do, um, there are certain areas where you do use these techniques. So we're going to look at a few of them just to understand what, what might this be used for. Um, so when you get into more complex analysis or decision making, um, those are some of the areas. So one is optimization. Um, mostly uh, I mean, <clears throat> businesses wouldn't exactly use 
uh, a derivative, but if you study some economics, do you take any economics courses here? I don't know your, yeah. You did it already. Which course was it? Economics or microeconomics or? Now you're doing macroeconomics. Okay. So some of what you did in economics involved finding equilibrium, supply and demand equilibrium, yes? Okay. So when you start dealing with that, and then you, did you learn about production functions? Loveness, please put your phone away. No phones allowed. Um, so production functions. So if you want to maximize a firm, wants to maximize its profit, let's say, and you know the production function, how do you find out where is the maximum profit? How much should it produce to maximize, to maximize its profit? And the answer is generally not make as much as possible. Make as much as possible sometimes is the right answer. Sometimes it's not the right answer. You should make less than the maximum you can make. That will actually maximize your profit. Now, how do you find that number? That requires calculus. Um, so that's called optimization, finding the maximum or the minimum of something. You want to minimize cost. Again, you need, max, you need to be able to calculate derivatives. Um, marginal analysis, which is a huge part of economics. Um, so I don't know if you covered this in your economics courses, but marginal revenue, marginal cost, did you come, did you talk about that? In? Financial auditing? Accounting, financial accounting. You all did the same course? Yeah? Marginal revenue, you remember? No? Uh, when did you do this course? Last semester? You guys need to remember this stuff. If you only learned it last semester, you should know this. Huh? Oh, your group did something else? Uh huh. But you should learn marginal revenue. It's a very important concept. So, we're going to do some examples during this course dealing with marginal revenue, marginal cost. Um, it's one of the most obvious applications of calculus in the realm of accounting and finance and business. Um, some other ones are continuous growth models. Um, you may not know what that is yet, but it's another area. Um, so I was talking about compound interest, or projecting the future values of an investment. So if I have an investment now, what will it be worth in five years, 10 years, 30 years, whatever? Um, and also the time value of money, which is a concept in economics. You may not get, I don't know if you'll get to that in your studies, but that's another economics concept. Um, so like the present value of money, right? Is a thousand kwacha today the same value as a thousand kwacha next month or next year? Which one would you prefer? Today. How much would I need to give you next month for you to take that instead of a thousand today? If I gave you a thousand and ten next month, would you take that or a thousand today? You take a thousand today. Okay. If I give you a thousand one hundred next month, which one would you take? I want everybody to vote. Who will take a thousand today? So let me make it clear. We don't need this anymore. I 
I didn't mention, maybe some of you know, but um, James um, had malaria and was hospitalized the last few days, which is why he's not here today. Um, so hopefully he'll be back next week. So I'm offering you a thousand today. Yep. Or in one month, um, I could offer you a thousand. 1,010, 1,100, 1,500, 2,000. How many of you, none of you would accept this. You would all choose this, right? Would anybody accept this? Who will take this over this? Anybody? Everybody? Huh? If I offer you a thousand today or a thousand in one month, which one would you pick? A thousand today. Okay. If I offer you a thousand and ten in one month or a thousand today, which one would you pick? A thousand today. Okay. Everybody? Everybody? Raise your hand. Yeah? Mike? Huh? You want the thousand today? Okay. If I offer you a thousand one hundred in one month or a thousand today, which one would you take? How many of you will still take a thousand today? One, two, three, four. You'll take it. That's more. Okay. So you would take a thousand one hundred. Okay. We have one person. Who would take a thousand? 500 in a month. Would you still take 1,000 today if I offered you 1,500 in one month? Who would still take 1,000 today? You still prefer 1,000 today than 1,500 in a month, okay? What are you choosing? You have to choose. <laughs> you want 1,000 today? Okay, so nobody will take this one. How about 2,000? How many of you will still take 1,000 today? Nobody? Who will take 2,000? One, two, three. You want, you want the 2,000? Okay. Now, I could go in between and say 1,600, 1,700, 1,800, and find where does everybody land? Yeah? How much will you accept? This, now, if, you know, money is money, then in a way this should be the same. Why? And this is true no matter who you ask. The exact number will be different. But everybody, if you give them the same amount, at even today and tomorrow, uh, this is interesting, if I say 1,000 today or 1,100 tomorrow, which one will you take? Now you'll take 1,100 tomorrow. Okay, but you won't take this much in a month. So the longer in the future, the more I have to give you to be equal to this. In other words, the thousand gets less and less valuable over time. Right? As time goes by, what that thousand is worth to you becomes less and less, simply because time is going because you could do something with that amount now, right? So this is the time value of money. The future value of money is different from the present value of money. And when you are valuing an investment or an asset, yeah, you have to account for that. That if I... Um, What's an example? Um, a business is deciding, do we, we have two options of investments. Yeah, we have an investment option A and an investment option B. And each of them is going to give us different returns on our investment. Yeah, different amounts. Let's say option A, and for simplicity, we will assume they both cost the same thing. Let's say they both are 10 million. They both cost 10 million, yeah? 
Um, option A will return a million, and then three million, and then four million, and then five million. Option B will give us uh, two, three, two, six. Uh, wait, that's 13, this is, oh yeah, they're the same, okay. So they both total 13 million. Yeah? Which one should you choose as a business? Now this is a question you might be asked if you're an accountant, right? The CEO says, I have these two investment options. They both cost the same. They both have the same total revenue after four years. Does it make a difference which one I choose? How would you decide? The way you would decide is using the time value of money. That this five is worth, right? One kwacha here is worth less than one kwacha here, is worth less than one kwacha here, is worth less than one kwacha here. So there's a formula where you multiply each of these by something, and then you add it up, and you get what is known as the net present value, or NPV, of this income stream. And this, here they look like the same. They're the same sum, right? This, though, will give you different numbers. And that will allow you to choose which one of these is the better investment. And your boss will be very happy. All right. Um, so that's related to continuous growth models with growth rates or depreciation is sort of the growth or decay. Um, we sort of talked a little bit about this in the context of marginal analysis, the revenue and cost functions, um, determining break-even analysis, how much do I have to produce to break even, um, how do I determine a pricing strategy, what price should I choose for a product, um, don't need that. what else, risk management, Risk management is a little bit, well, actually, no, it's related to um, the stock market, so pricing derivatives. This derivatives, by the way, is not the derivatives we are doing in calculus. This is a derivative in the sense of, you all know what stocks are? Or no? Stocks. Do you know what are stocks? Or shares in a company? Derivatives is when I, you and I, in a way, it's um, <clears throat> a derivative is a financial instrument, a financial instrument, a contract that is based on something else, on the value of something else. So a derivative might be, um, do you know what are options? Stock options. Stock options. The option. So I say to you, I want the option to buy. You produce maize. I want the option to buy from you maize next April at this price. We agree on a price. Whatever the market is in April doesn't matter. This is the price. Okay? You and I agree on a price, and for this contract, I will pay you something. I will pay you something for the option of buying at this price. I don't have to, but if I come to you in April and I say, okay, I want now to buy from you at this agreed price, you have to sell to me. Now, why would I do that? Why would I pay money just for the option of buying from him at this agreed price. What do you think? So think about what happens if the market price of maize, yeah, the, the, um, it's, a, it's a bad year, the production of maize is low, so the price 
it goes high, right? And we agreed on a price that is less than now the market price, right? I want to buy from you at the lower price that we agreed, right? So I paid some money for the option to now come to you and say, okay, I want to now buy from you 10 tons of maize at this price, which is what we agreed. And you have to sell to me. Even though you could sell at the market price, you have to sell to me at this price. On the other hand, if there's a very good year, lots of production, the price is low. And the price we agreed is higher than the market price. What am I going to do with my option? Am I going to use it? No. I can, I, so we agreed, I don't know the price of maize, but let's say I will buy from you 10 tons at a million. Watch out. Um, but now on the market, I can buy 10 tons for 700,000. Why would I buy from you at a million when I can go to anybody and buy it for 700, right? Or even from you at 700. I don't have to use the contract. I don't, the contract is that if I want, you have to sell to me. The contract is not that you, I have to buy from you. It's only that I can, I can choose. You have no choice. That's the contract. Okay? So you see how it works as a hedge. This is called a hedge. I am hedging against the, the price of maize. That if it goes too high, I have this option to get some at a lower price but I pay you something for that. So if the price is low, I can buy at 700, but that, let's say I paid you 50,000 for the, for the contract, then that was 50,000 for nothing in a way. But it wasn't for nothing. It was to protect me if the price goes up. That's an example of a derivative. Another derivative would be, huh? Swaps, yeah. Um, so they become almost like bets. So like we make a contract that if the price of the dollar goes up in a month, then you pay me something. If it goes down, then I pay you something. This is like legalized gambling. But that's a derivative, essentially. It's a financial instrument that is based or derived from the value of another financial instrument, which is different than it is based on an actual asset or a stock, which is a share of the firm, an actual share in the assets of the firm. The derivative is not, I don't own anything. There's no asset. The whole value of the derivative is linked to the value of some other financial instrument. And pricing derivatives is a very complicated thing in the stock market. So they have very fancy equations. Um, the Black-Scholes model is one of them for pricing options, and it includes derivatives. It's what is called a differential equation. And differential equations are amazing. The whole purpose of doing calculus is to get to differential equations, I think. They are... I can't even tell you how amazing and fantastic they are. Sorry, my voice is going. Sorry, how was the time? Oh. Sorry, we're over time. Um, the other two areas, budgeting and forecasting. If you're doing sophisticated budgeting, um, or if you're doing forecasting, so I've done, I'm not even a financial person, but I've done consulting where I built a whole forecasting model um, or cash flow forecasts, um, net income forecasts, and so on. <coughs> if you get into very sof more sophisticated forecasting, then you start to use certain calculus concepts as well. Um, and then statistical analysis and data mining, if you end up specializing in that area, then you might also use some of these concepts. Um, so, 
all that to say, we're studying calc because I think it's important for us to appreciate why are we studying this. Um, if you were studying engineering or physics or mathematics, then you really need calculus as part of your everyday work. In accounting and business and finance, it's not so much part of your everyday work, but they are concepts which it's important to understand. Um, and depending on how you, what career you end up doing, the kind of work might require some parts of calculus. So those are two reasons to study it and to learn it well. Um, and in the process, you'll also get a lot of practice at, at math, which is, of course, valuable in its own right. So we reviewed the assignment. I think we spent more than half the class doing that. Um, but I thought that was important um, in general. I don't want to spend that much time each class, but a little bit of discussion about the assignment. Um, and then there will be the, the topic of that week. And since we didn't cover any of the material, I may not... Hmm, I was going to assign a problem set, but now it doesn't make sense to give you a problem set for material we didn't cover. Um, oh, I was going to... Let me just check real quick. <coughs> um. <coughs> yeah, I was going to assign you this for this week. Um, so this is from, so last week, like for today, the assignment was 1.1 and 1.2. So this week, it'll be exercise 1.3, um, which means you should read this section. This is graphs of linear equations. This will be good review also. Um, now, I'm sure that you've learned graphs, yeah? Yes? No? A little bit? That's why we're doing it. It's review. Um, so, read the chapter. If there are parts that you read and, and you're, it's really not clear. So one, work together to understand. Um, there are practice problems. Why I like this book, you see, for example, it gives an example and then it explains the whole solution. What do you do, and then what, and then what? It's a very nice book. It really, it shows step by step, how do you do it? And then it has a practice problem for you to try, and then it continues. So the whole section is, I forget, uh, where does it start? Lots of figures and pictures to explain things. And then mm -hmm, some key terms, if you're not sure what are these so you'll notice in the text, it puts these words in pink like this, and then you can find here is the definitions if you're, a bit, if you're not sure. Um, and then the exercises. So you can try the exercises right away if you're comfortable. But if you read something, you're like, mm, I'm not sure what to do here, then go back and, and read the section. This will be a good review. Um, so again, this is about linear equations, which are the simplest kinds of functions. So up to here. So just to be clear, 11 is the last one. So you go from number one. So when I give page numbers, they are the page numbers that are printed in the book. All right, so this is page 52. It's, here it says page 65 because it's counting the cover page, the contents, the, all that stuff at the beginning. The PDF has all those pages, right? But I'm giving you the number, this number here, that's printed in the book. So this would be page 52. 
number one all the way to number 11. So only 11 problems this week. Um, I need to do next week. And we will stop there for today.